I can hear you, yeah, loud and clear. Are you cold in your house? You got your hood on? Not really, just a little bit. Who's playing the piano, Ben? I always just play it, but I don't really know how to play it. Sounds nice. Sounds a bit like Laura and Hardy. Like who? Laura and Hardy. Laura and Hardy? Yeah. Comedians? Yeah. Silent movies. Okay. What do you want to right. talk about? Um, maybe we could talk about perspective. Nice. Uh, the reason I think perspective is because um, you can look at your you can always look at your situation in two ways. Uh, one way you can look at it as um, completely bleak and miserable, and the other way you can look at it as uh, amazingly fortunate and such a you've had so many great experiences already, and uh, you've got such a golden opportunity up ahead. Um, so the, you always have these duali this duality in spiritual life is what's going on in your inner world and what's going on in on your external world. In the external world, you may have a you know you may get come into a load of money and um, everything goes really well. You find the right situation and all your material desires are starting to get fulfilled. But internally, your world is in in ruins. You know everything is tumbling down and you. You're losing your resolve to practice spiritual life. You're finding it hard to follow the principles, finding it hard to chant. So better to trade uh, having a good inner world at the cost of it not being such a good external situation. Mm. And the, the mistake is people are thinking, well, you know, if I just get the external situation together, automatically everything will just fall into place, you know? Of course, I'm bound to be happy once you get these things. But it's not a fact, you know, it's a big assumption. It's an actual fact. Hmm. What is it? Nadanam Najanam Nasundarim Kavitam Bajagadesha Kame Mama Jamani Jamani Shri Bhavata Bhakti Haiti Kitai. Well, yeah, those verses they come in sequence. So number four, that's after Finada P. And uh I think for a lot of us they get stuck on number two. Uh, I, I'm so fortunate, I'm so unfortunate that because of offences I'm making, I have no taste for the holy name. And they don't get to the next stage, which is, uh, yeah, that's right, you're worthless and you're, um, and you're you know, a dis despicable living entity uh, and therefore you should be lower than us. You must have you should be. And yeah. So uh, if you can get to that, then uh, your chanting will be pretty good. Then automatically, all those desires will get kicked out. Nandu 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 of feeling yourself worthless i think a lot of people are uncomfortable with that feeling of being of feeling worthless and, and maybe they'll withdraw themselves from the spiritual environment to yeah. <laughs> to avoid that feeling of worthlessness like like um find their own arena where they can find some feel some kind of worth you know whatever it is materially or... well it's interesting because w when we take our christian consciousness we we take with us um we have um, inbuilt um, bad habits and agendas, and one of them is promotion. We're thinking, um, can't wait till I uh, get some position and, and, and get some recognition. And then if you look right at the very top of the Sampradaya, the Goswamis are, are, are just walking around with nothing in rags, and they're just having um, a handful of rice every other day, one or two hours sleep, and they're in abject poverty. And, you know, um, Rupa and Sanatan were like, 
gorgeously wealthy, you know, like multi-millionaires, maybe even billionaires, and uh, they turned it all away and went to that situation. So that's what um, promotion and success looks like in spiritual life. Everything is taken away. You've got nothing. You just, you know, but um, <clears throat> we, we carry like, I think anyway, it's hard not to, we carry with us um, a kind of predetermined idea of what we think um, going places in spiritual life is going to mean, you know. Mm. I was, you say that, I was wondering about this actually, um, you know, like maybe like for myself, I, I behaved in a way where because of the results of my actions, I feel bad about it. I feel kind of worthless. Uh, I can't believe I did that. What have, what about these devotees that uh, they've got that feeling, but they haven't necessarily done the big mess ups, if you know what I mean? Like, you know, like Rupa Goswami or Sanat Goswami, I'm not sure if they massively committed any offenses or, but they have that feeling of worthlessness naturally. Like how do they acquire that without going through the, being an offensive yeah. person, you know? Well, if you obviously if you're a Nietzsche sitter, uh, then um, you will just you and and because you're practicing Raganuga, everything will be very spontaneous. You know, everything will just flow. Um, but where we're in the material energy and we're trying to get out, and the intermediate stage is quite tricky because it's a bit like lying in a bath full of seaweed and then suddenly deciding you want to get out of the bath. Once you're out of the bath and your feet are on solid ground, that's fine. But getting out of the bath is very slippery. And then even you can just slide back in, you know. It's like it would take a sustained, determined effort to drag yourself out the bath, you know. Uh, if it's full of seaweed and, uh, you know, the water's red hot and you've been chilling out in there for, for six hours, and then suddenly you've got to get out of the bath. It's like, oh, but it's comfy, it's nice. And you're trying to, you're trying to drag yourself out, you know. Once you're out, then, um, then things will come naturally for you. Um, and so Krishna may have to arrange some adverse uh, condition to shake you up and make you realize that this, uh, you know, maybe he has to throw a crocodile in the bath. And you mm. think, oh my God, I can't stay in this bath, you know, it's dangerous. I, I have to get out. So Krishna will orchestrate, just like Shri Prabhupada said, for him, he was going to be a big uh, pharmaceutical uh, business man, you know, and uh, that fell through. And um, Krishna just took everything away. Prabhupada's talking about it and he's chuckling, you know. He says that this was actually his special mercy, not, not, not to give me everything, but to take everything away from me. You know? Yeah, and I guess that takes like what we started with perspective, you know, like to have that perspective. Yeah. How can we arm ourselves with having that perspective of seeing everything as Krishna's mercy? Yeah, it's, um, it's, we, we have to read uh, more seriously and really, really study and really contemplate things, really think what it must have been like. Um, I mean, in Lord Chaitanya's time, he, he did have very aff affluent, uh, followers as well. Some some were very um, poor, and even Rupa Goswami and Sankar Goswami, although they were very poor themselves, but they were in touch with a lot of very rich merchants and uh, you know big leaders, and they got temples built. They had plenty of uh, finance at their fingertips, but they just chose that they, did, they, they didn't want to get involved with that anymore. You know, so that would be you know you could look at it like that. Well. Can I become so renounced that Krishna can give me so much material facility and I know exactly how to use everything from Krishna's service, you know? And if Krishna knows it's not going to be a distraction for me. And look at Srila Prabhupada, everything was taken away. And then he ended up with million, millions of times more than what he'd had taken away in the first place, you know? So uh, facility will come. If you want to do something, like Tarkanath, you know? Tarkanath, where he... He, he has a dream. It's like, uh, who would think of even thinking of buying a five million pound project, you know? And he, he's just so determined he's going to do it, and it's happened, you know? So that's how powerful it is when 
they say they're all great people and visionaries. Mm. They see what it is that they want and that becomes their perspective. And they say their attitude is more important than facts. Mm. So you could say, you can say to Tartner, well, look, the fact is, Tartner, we've not got two haters to rub together. I don't know why you're talking about five million, you know. But he's just like, you know, Gourmage wants this. I'll find a way, you know. Mm. I guess attitude is, your attitude is an expression of your perspective as well, isn't it? If, you, if you've got that negative mentality, nothing's possible, I can't do it. Whereas yeah. I know with Tarkinath, his, his vision is like the world is possible. We can do anything. Like, yeah. let's just conquer it. You know, um, we were speaking to Gopal on the, on the call the other day and um, they were just in Mayapur, Tarkinath, on Advaita Acharya's appearance day and um, Sri Ramraj was given this garland made of almonds, like a Maha garland. And um, Shiva Ramaj straight away gave it to Tarkanath and said, um, "Worship this for T Krishna." Um, so he, and then and then the next day, I think they went to they went to Advaita Acharya's house somewhere in Mayapur, and um, the pujari straight away went to Tarkanath and put Advaita Acharya's garland on on onto Tarkanath straight away. So it was like um, yeah, he's receiving the mercy of the Panchatapa, you know, like um, that was the first temple we opened. He, he opened in Swansea, was a Panchadapa temple. So like, he's very, he must be very dear to the, the whole team, you know? <laughs> I mean, if we, if we could find how to do that, how to become visionaries, you know, um, imagine something and then start um, visualizing it. And then in true course, it will happen, you know? Hmm. We just have to do the. We just have to do the work. We can't be lazy about it, to be a visionary. And uh, and then yeah, that will change your perspective on things. And then, it's just a question of uh, how you get from A to B, you know. And obstacles are things you only see when you lose sight of the goal. So once you've established the vision, and you've got that perspective, then um, everything else pales into insignificance. You know. Mm. Especially for us, because we're we're leaving a temporary life to enter into an eternal realm, and mm. just imagine what that must be like when you when you go into a situation where your identity is eternal. How, how you know, I mean, in one sense, it's scary because um, we say that we don't die in Krishna consciousness. We say the soul doesn't die, but the fact is, we actually actually we do die, because everything that we know ourselves as is is finished. It's cast into the oblivion forever. When you when you leave this body, everything you, you knew yourself as, everything pertaining to the body is left behind. So it your false ego, it's the death of your false ego. Mm -hmm. And then can you imagine the your what your perspective is when you are in your eternal situation where you where you've always been like this and you always will be like this and nothing is going to threaten that you will just always be like this and then you have some flicker of a memory of a, of a fraction of a split second of being away from this and then it's like that's it dead gone dead and gone forever <laughs> yeah and i guess that's part of the that tronada piece in each and a kind of mood is you can you can kind of chant in that mood when a little bit of that false identity is dying, you know, like when you're feeling that crush of, ah, oh, you know, I'm not I'm not Krishna, I'm not the enjoyer, and yeah. I'm not here for exploiting it. Like if Krishna is kind to you, he'll expose you as a fraud, if you know what I mean, and it and it really hurts. But then if you go into the japa in that mood, it seems to be a lot more. Um, connected do you know like a lot more real well you know it's funny that you bring that point up because um i won't i won't mention any names but um there's one devotee right now on facebook and he just seems to be going from one controversy to the next and he's talking about this one being out of it and then he's dealing with this and he's on to this and he's on to the next thing and i was thinking why does he why doesn't he bring in um the perspective of um, what's our relationship to the holy name and uh, are, are we making um, 
tangible progress which uh, sufficiently to secure our success in chanting the holy name before the end of this life and uh, why why is he so distracted and so obsessed with the minute of material existence that's going on i mean i suppose in one sense he's thinking he wants to help the society and identify this problem and identify the next one you know but really um krishna says machita savadegani if you become conscious of me you'll pass over all the all the garbage of the material world if you just become conscious of me that's the only solution really I'm not trying to reform people or point they've done this wrong or said that wrong or whatever else you know um okay that may be an observation that you make on the way but um you should bring it to its conclusion that therefore we need to become conscious of krishna and therefore we need to chant the holy name properly you know? mm -hmm. and one, one of the things i'm going to bring up on the japa sangha uh this um uh wednesday uh, thursday is um when we're chanting are we, are we conscious of what offenses we're making or are we just chanting and hoping for the best because um even if you're committing all 10 offenses and you're chanting attentively the attentive chanting will relieve you of the reactions of the 10 offenses you know but if you're if you're chanting inattentively then it means all the other offenses that you're making as well and they're only not getting dealt with but they're, but they're increasing you know so um that, that ruins your ability then to have a, a transcendental perspective you know mm. yeah I've, I've i've personally found that once it starts like spinning out of control and your perspective starts becoming more and more covered more and more, more material perspective then the offenses start mounting on top of each other you can't be attentive you can't respect the devotees because your job is bad you can't um follow nicely you know like it's like this horrible snowball that keeps building up building up building up and the only thing that kind of stopped it for me was like really getting into like well for me it was like i got into a festival day and really just like got on my knees and was just like niching under his appearance day and um some something about the power of these festival days for um turning a situation around and just really appealing for mercy um it kind of blew the snowball to pieces you know what i mean like and it really like i felt like it's under just uh kind of gave, gave me a new lease of life or another chance you know what i mean so we've got to grow up and yeah. come to festival days are good and also any day you can get when you can go to bed at six and rise at midnight and chant 64 you know mm. that those are those are they will blow the cobwebs away like anything you know i'm trying to do it i've been i was doing it for a while um every week and then i just lost lost it and it's it's like about five years ago now and I, I keep thinking every week i'm gonna do it this week i'm gonna do it this week never never quite happens but um that really does uh, break the uh, sequence and then and then let's look at what how do the offenses come in so I'm chanting and I'm, and I'm being inattentive. Okay, so what am I thinking about? I'm, I'm maybe musing about the way this devotee mistreated me. I'm dwelling on the faults. Okay, there's the first offense coming in straight away. Mm -hmm. Then um, second offense, I'm chanting. It's not really happening for me. I'm wondering whether there's other mantras that would maybe work as well or even better, or maybe not mantras and maybe thinking, a potion or a crystal or some kind of material facility something which is undermining my faith in uh, mm -hmm. in krishna and then of course the third one comes in i'm not chanting well therefore i'm disobeying the words of the spiritual master that was his first order for me chant nicely 16 rounds every day and then um fourth offense is you know not really uh taking the reading so seriously and not really applying it and then fifth this is imagination six uh that's similar to imagination uh, maybe, you know maybe uh this only works for people who were uh, were born in india or something or, or people that are very pious that have come from the heavenly planets or something like that and then and then i'm starting to 
uh, lose my strength to follow the principle, so I, I start falling down a bit, and then I think oh, I'll be okay, I just chant seventh, and then eight comes in, it just becomes a ritual. I just put the bead bag on and shake it for two hours so people think I'm a devotee. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so these other offenses all start to creep in. Ninth, maybe um, I lose my um, discrimination. So I'm maybe not preaching the glories to someone that's not qualified. But maybe I'm I'm speaking in such a way that it's putting that person off chanting, mm. which is also. <laughs> and then the tenth offense comes in. Uh, with the tenth offense, maintaining material attachment, even even after understanding some of the instructions, is interesting. That initially you don't understand, and therefore you're doing it. And then later on, you realize it, and you do understand, and then you're actually purposely doing it, you can't use that excuse anymore, you know, which is similar to the seventh. And then because all that's going on, you think, oh, this is hopeless. So you're just chanting, but you're not really trying to hear it. And then there you go, all 11 offenses. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's hard work. It's uh, And it's um, and we say them every day, at least in our temple, I think most temples do, before you start chanting, so that you can try and think, okay, what... How am I going to change this? I'm going to change my perspective so that I'm I'm not, you know, I, I, I agree that I shouldn't do these things, but I'm doing them. So how am I going to stop doing them? How am I going to become aware and also convince myself that I can do it, you know, that I can actually do it? Or do I just convince myself that I can't, that, that, that this is the best that I can do? You know? mm. Yeah, it's um, in one sense, though, it's... Um... In terms of perspective like if you have found yourself really spinning off and like what you said racking up all these offenses it's like um it's really an impetus to start like really reaching out to all these like like a Tarek Naf gave a call to us recently and he was saying just pray to everyone pray to Nishinga Dave pray to Varaha Dave pray to Vamana Dave pray to Prahlad Maharaj pray to the tree pray to the, the moon pray, pray to the sun and like um that's something like he was talking about doing a 64 round day. The other day I was doing that and I was just walking around the house and I've got like paintings everywhere of all of these different, you know, different personalities. And I found myself at one point, I just started like, I was just every single painting, I was just praying, 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 just help me, help me uh, just be a servant and let go of all of this junk that's just building up and let me, and like, I found like when you try and connect and you try to pray, um, then the Jap becomes like, alive again like you know it's not just like I'm good, I'm good. like it's like zoom. like if you're um so that that power of prayer it's like if you reframe the perspective okay i'm an offender so therefore i need to ask for help you know i've got a pro like in alcoholics anonymous like i i am i'm back to and i'm an alcoholic or whatever you know so i am back to and i'm an offend offender against the holy name so therefore give me some help krishna <laughs> Like a, yeah, yeah. yeah and, um, so that's the second shikshastika, isn't it? Um, because I have no taste, obviously I'm making I'm making offences, and then so then very humbly he's approaching. So uh, when we're when we're praying, we could be praying proudly, is it? Could, could be praying. Uh, come on, get it together. I want this. I want that. I want the next thing. You know. So it's how to pray. I mean, if we really want to, if we really want our prayer to register, then it has to be with humility, utter humility. And mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, that's some, something you have to work on. Gen generally, we get to the stage of becoming humble because as we as we go along in practicing Krishna consciousness, it, it starts becoming obvious that we're not going to be able to do this by ourselves, you know, we will need this help. And mm -hmm. then, the, then the praying comes in and the humility comes in because and we'll, you know, it's a scary thing because uh, if you don't get that help, then you can get swept away by the material energy and you can feel the pull of the modes of nature, the attraction to things, the, the sinful desires in the heart, all pulling us to do a U10 on our spiritual life and get back into the very thing we were trying to get away from, you know. Mm. So uh, <clears throat> we need help, we need mercy. Yeah, I found if you string up enough offences, then it's almost like you've just plugged the fan back in. 
you know, like it gets to the point where you're just, okay, let's keep going from where we left off. And Yeah, I didn't go to notice. I mean, because I live outside of the house, I find myself, I haven't done it for a while actually, but every now and again, I'm chanting and the bead bank's in one hand and the hoover's in the other, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, what am I doing, you know? And uh, you can just kind of run on and then suddenly you realize, oh, okay, stop. Because one thing leads to the next, and you think, I can do this. And you're, you're trying to chant at the same time. You've only got limited time. You're trying to get things done. And that, what I find is very, very quickly when you chant like that, the, the material desires start to come back up again. They just they just start getting watered. Even though you're not consciously trying to bring them back, but just because the chanting is inattentive, it leads to the material desires start to flare up. You know? Yeah, and it's like um, if you have desires while you're chanting, I've found personally like the opportunity to execute those desires becomes like it's almost like Krishna's arrangement. How perfect you could have this. It's like if like if you're cultivating a desire for long enough in your japa, it's like the road opens up and it's like you want to do this. Here you go. There's the perfect opportunity. Like um, it's and it, you could even be convinced to think that that's Krishna. He's supporting you because it's so perfect, you know. It's like, oh, Krishna wants me to do this, you know. Or you could be wary that, okay, what's that? What's happening here? This is too easy, you know. Yeah. This is all getting laid on a plate. There mm. must be a catch somewhere. <laughs> yeah, true. Mm. And uh, and usually there is, you know. Usually, um, when like Maya's bartering with us, look, I'll give you this if you stop being so Krishna conscious, be a little bit less Krishna conscious and I'll send you some facility along the way. You know. Taranga Ranjani is the, uh, one of the forms of insane devotional service mentioned in the Madhuri Kandamana by Vishnu Chakravati Thakur. So Enjoying the ways. Facility comes, we, get, we get facility, you know, and then we're thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, like on the street, you can learn to chat people up, you know, and you can enable them. And you, you become like a little bit of a celebrity and you think, this guy's really cool. He's just come over. He's making me laugh. He's got me buying these books. He's preaching to me. Yeah, this is a pretty cool dude, you know? And you go away thinking, I'm a pretty cool dude, actually. So that's Taranga Ranjani. That's you enjoying the facilities that are coming your way. You're getting some ability to talk and impress people. And now you're starting to kind of languish in it and think, wow, I'm a pretty far guy. Okay. I probably I probably been born and planted here strategically because I must be like some liberated soul that I just haven't because of my humility I'm not really aware of it, you know. Yeah. It's true as well, because like you start following the principles, giving up sinful life, chanting, living in an ashram, like the mode of goodness comes around pretty quickly. So or it becomes stronger and your stronger influence. So it's like you can actually see how to do things in the world easier than you could before. Yeah. So it's like you have more opportunity to exploit the material energy because you've got a clearer vision because you're more influenced by the more goodness than you were. Well, the problem as well is if, if the main thrust for you coming, if your perspective in coming initially was out of distress and all you really wanted was relief, meaning, I need meaning to my life. So suddenly you get meaning to your life. You start understanding there's planetary systems, there's other living entities you've lived before, you'll be living again, you're not the body. All these things start to come in and then suddenly you're like, well, there's no distress, what do I have to worry about? I'm an eternal, blissful soul full of knowledge, you know? Really, I don't have to really worry about it very much. I think I can go back out there and, and uh, take my chances with the material energy and, you know, I'll still do a bit of chanting and, and uh, I always know Krishna is God, so I'll be okay. You know? So unless you shift your perspective from taking to Krishna conscious because you're getting relief from distress, on into by studying the books and becoming more and more aware, coming up to the highest level of devotee, which is that you're now fully confident that Krishna is the absolute truth, and that the goal of existence is to is to pursue that. And fully realize it, fully connect with that reality, you know. Unless you shift over from into that perspective, then there's every chance you'll just uh, bogatyag 
you've renounced and now you're going to go back to the boga and then when the boga gets too much then you'll chug again you know you'll vomit again and then after you've vomited you look at the vomit <coughs> and think, actually that vomit doesn't look that bad there's a few nice bits there and then before you know it fantasy you're back eating it again you know and then of course you vomit again you know but we have to shift the perspective so that we lose the uh, attraction for the for the very things that cause us to vomit in the first place that's why i've been really thinking about a lot recently like if only i was i would love to be as attracted to krishna and Gornitai as i am to these different material things like i was i was thinking that this morning like if only i could have that kind of attachment because that that would just make everything easy you know everything would be because it's a strong attachment we've had i guess we've built it up over many yeah. millions and billions of lifetimes you know like if, if only i guess when will that day be mine where i can literally just give all to granite and also don't take it cheaply that um you know it doesn't come easy getting free from, from these mental desires doesn't come easy and uh and and that's actually one of the one of the big mistakes that we make is that we think we have got free from it and we relax we think i'm okay now and I'm a cool dude. I'm not attracted to these things anymore, so I can play around with them. Mm. And uh, so that's that's another problem as complacency comes in. You become complacent. I remember one of the boys actually he been in the boy about four years, and um, he ended up he ended up um, leaving. And before he actually left, he was telling me his new philosophy. So what had actually happened was before he'd had the full gross fall down. He'd had a sort of fall down and he was saying, um, you know, we shouldn't be disgusted with sex life because that just shows that we're attached to it <laughs> and we have to just be kind of indifferent to it. And, you know, if it, if it comes, it comes, if it doesn't, it doesn't, but it's, it's no big problem for us either way. And I was saying, well, what about that, that prayer by Yimunacharya, you know, that I spit at the thought. And he was saying, well, that's just for beginners, you know, to tell them that. But once you become more mature in your spiritual life, you don't have to spit at the thought anymore. So not only did he, did he not spit at the thought, but he fully embraced the thought. And he went out to go and pursue that those material desires, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to be careful that my doesn't kind of work on us in such a way that our perspective changes and we philosophically deviate, just to fall down is fine because everyone knows where they stand. I shouldn't have done it. I did it. I'm a bad boy. I'm so sorry. I'll try not to do it the next time. That's fine. But I did it. I'm probably going to do it again. Let's look at this. Is it realistic to really follow four principles? Why don't we just follow three? You know, it was wrong to ask people to do that. Even one of the, uh, one of the Prophet and disciples, you know, he, uh, he, had, he had disciples himself. And he left and he said, it's not possible to follow all the four like the principles. We told all his disciples, just follow through. Hmm. So that's a philosophical fall down. It's almost worse because it's more subtle, right? It is much worse, yeah. Because Prabhupada, he was okay about people having a gross fall down, even if they were um, like Jiva Sios and yes, he would, he would just reinstate them. But if they philosophically deviated, then he would, he would have nothing to do with them anymore. You know? because it would just that would just contaminate everybody else and, and mislead other people which is a great violence to mis mislead yourself and then mislead others is, is, is bad you know at my heart kill the soul okay well there you go that was a cherry one tonight wasn't it <laughs> yeah nice thank you but, uh, anyway it's good because uh, if you are aware that you're making offenses when you're chanting and you're becoming humble, then you, then you can start to approach Nadanam, Nadanam, Sundanam, then, then the material desires will start to go away, you know, because you'll be chanting in a much purer way when you're chanting in a humble state of mind. And that pure chanting will purge you of material desires, whereas the offensive chanting, Namaharad, that actually nourishes material desires. Nice. Thank mm -hmm. you.